The following is an Eyewitness News special presentation. John Boutet says he wrote the song Down and the Treme on these steps. Now, if you've heard the song, the song is about the energy and the culture, the vibrancy, kids running through the street, music playing till two in the morning. It was so inspirational. Well, like the house that's no longer here, that energy is now gone. Over the course of 30 minutes, we ask what happened to Treme and how does a culture thrive in the neighborhood that some say has died? It's Sunday in New Orleans, and there's energy surging through the streets of Treme. It's cold, y'all. Five out of joy. Today's a beautiful day. You ready? All right, you're going to walk it all up. Pray. It's a familiar sound and smell, and as time passes, a growing excitement. A crowd gathers in the streets, anxiously awaiting the call of a drum. The sound signifies it's time to second line. The Black Men of Labor has paraded for more than 25 years after the death of famed musician Danny Barker, who believed in upholding the traditional jazz standard. Danny single-handedly cultivated the traditional brass band music because it was, it was dying. Danny said, if we don't teach these young guys how to play this music, through attrition, we're gonna lose. And as tradition would have it, the Social Aid and Pleasure Club second line through Fulberg Treme, considered sacred ground to many. But when the music slows down during the dirge, mourning ensues. The parade moves somberly down the street, some remembering the death of a friend, loved one, musician, or public figure. Others mourning the death of a neighborhood. This is not mystery. This is our history. It's all about the culture. From Esplanade to St. Louis, Broad to North Rampart, Treme is considered ground zero for culture and activism in America. The oldest integrated neighborhood, free people of color thrived with more than 80% owning land in Treme during slavery in the Deep South. It's home to one of the earliest known civil rights movements in the South, dating back to the 19th century, when residents formed the Citizens Committee selecting Treme resident Homer Plessy to directly challenge segregated railroad car laws in Louisiana. Plessy versus Ferguson would lead to the separate but equal doctrine we know as Jim Crow laws. And businesses line the streets of Claiborne Avenue, providing a solid economic base for Treme. And then there's the music. From Louis Armstrong playing in the red light district known as Storyville and jazz clarinetist Alphonse Picou, to Benny Jones striking up with the Treme brass band and trombone Shorty picking up his first horn. Jazz was born on these streets and passed down from generation to generation. I can remember seeing Trombone Shorty and his, his literally, and his little brass band in diapers uh, playing on, uh, sorry Shorty, yeah. uh, uh, you know, playing on plastic trombones and beating on pots and boxes. Musicians, educators, artists, craftsmen, political activists, all would find themselves immersed in one of New Orleans' first suburbs, the neighborhood that was the multicultural epicenter of New Orleans. Good evening, everybody! Including Kermit Ruffins. Musically, do you think New Orleans would be what it is without Treme? I'm quite sure that Treme contribute at least 65 to 75 percent of this culture as uh, far as jazz is concerned the birthplace of jazz in New Orleans. Treme brought the world-renowned musician to the neighborhood when he was just 18 years old, just a few miles down from the Lower Ninth Ward. And I um, fell in love with it and I never went back to the Lower Ninth Ward. I wanted to wake up 
in the heart of um, the Treme, where the music was real popular and real vibrant. I mean, on any given day, it would look like Mardi Gras at nine in the morning. Well, what is Treme right now? Well, Treme was, um, was one of the best neighborhoods in America. Treme, as we knew it, is dead. It has died. Why do you say that? Because all the juice has been, all the, all the oxygen has been sucked out of the room. The cultural oxygen, the children, the raison d'etre that we once woke up in the morning and lived for. Hey, Shaq, hey, Lava, how you doing, man? Let's go. Like the second line said, past of the neighborhood, those who used to call Treme home say culture has become transient, leaving it with no sense of community. But where did Treme's soul go? According to the culture bearers, it left, right along with those who call the neighborhood home, some willingly, others unwillingly. The part of the Treme that I knew coming up is that it's gone. The folks aren't there anymore. There's, there's, uh, Unless you bring those people back, you'll never have that part of the Treme again. We may never meet again. Jazz vocalist John Boutte has long been a vocal critic of the changes happening in Treme. Changes, he says, forced out some of the poorest people who provide some of the richest cultural experiences. After Hurricane Katrina, a song he recorded about his life in Treme had resurfaced on the HBO series bearing the same name. When you wrote that song, yes, um, at which you kind of had a resurgence with Treme. Right, well, you know what? I wrote that song in 1993, and nobody cared about Treme. Yeah. Nobody cared about Treme. Well, we all are in. The series featured musicians and characters throughout New Orleans as they attempted to recover after Hurricane Katrina. One of those musicians is Benny Jones, founder of the Treme Brass Band. We started to hire a bunch of people in the neighborhood. I was in the Treme series twice. I was in two series with the Treme movie. It really helped people out and got a, get a, got a chance to see it what really went on in the neighborhood. They painted this mural. They painted this mural. Benny was born in Treme, starting the Dirty Dozen Brass Band before branching off to start the Treme Brass Band. But even Benny can't deny, the portrayal of Treme on screen, on the internet, just about anywhere, versus the reality of Treme in 2019, present a stark difference. So what is it like now? Oh, it's gone, oh, that's gone. Architecture, bars, restaurants, neighbors, all gone, leaving Treme as a shadow of its former self. So what happened to Treme? Those who lived through it blame a myriad of issues, all in the name of urban renewal. It was known as a place publique, a public place before it was known as Congo Square. It was known by the Spaniards from the 1760s when they took over Louisiana as Plaza de los Negros, a black place. But of course, it became known later as Congo Square, where the indigenous were allowed to congregate. at a neighborhood and what took it down, it's never one thing, it's a gumboard thing. But I can tell you unequivocally, nothing traumatized the Treme more than the, the building of the I-10. North Claiborne was home to a bustling business district. It was estimated more than 120 businesses ran along the corridor and hundreds of oak trees. But to build the highway, the state took over several properties along Claiborne between Tulane and St. Bernard Avenue. 
Some refer to it as the monster. The building of the I-10 overpass over North Claiborne sent the business district into economic decline. Today, only a few dozen businesses still stand. Charbonnet Funeral Home is one of them, sitting along Claiborne Avenue since 1883. It ran all of the, uh, all the family-owned black businesses away. Uh, what Magazine Street is now, Claiborne Avenue used to be like that. I mean, with, with all kind of African-American owned businesses, insurance companies, grocery stores, all that left when the interstate came along. The elevated highway plan proposed in the 40s was to include Claiborne Avenue and a highway that would have gone from Elysian Fields along the riverfront and front of Jackson Square to Canal Street. It would then descend into a tunnel. It would have been called the Vucare Riverfront Expressway, but French Quarter preservationists fought that plan for decades. In 1969, they won their battle. But the opposition of those living in Treme wasn't enough to stop the planes from moving forward there. In 1966, crews began to destroy the neutral ground, replacing oak trees with tall cement pillars. And we used to have kids playing, and we had the, the neutral ground on Claiborne Avenue, which was the largest and prettiest neutral ground in the city, where we used to play and had oak trees and azaleas, and it was just a, a wonderful place to grow up in. Today, the only sign of oak trees are those painted on the pillars beneath the highway. Claiborne Avenue. Dr. Reynard Sanders and other preservationists started the Claiborne Avenue History Project as a way to remember what this street was to Chume. And every community has a commercial hub. Um, now, in New Orleans, we had several of them that serviced the black community, but none like Claiborne Avenue. The expressway wasn't the first assault on Treme. The state and federal government implemented urban renewal plans that would displace hundreds of African American families from their homes. Why do you feel as though Treme was considered dispensable? You look at the notion of, well, there are African Americans there, people of color that's free. You know, some people would not necessarily place a higher value on individuals living in those neighborhoods. Gentrification of the Treme neighborhood would begin with the building of the municipal auditorium, tearing down the historic Treme market. That was in the 30s. Each decade after, urban renewal projects targeted Treme and surrounding communities. Initially thought of in the 20s, plans to build a cultural complex in the space that now houses Armstrong Park resurfaced in the 60s. Dozens of city blocks in Treme were leveled. It was supposed to be the opera center. Yeah. And uh, that didn't work. Then they talked about making it a, 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 an amusement type park like Tivoli Gardens in, in, in Europe. And that didn't work. And, and now it's just an open space, uh, which is nice. But it used to be homes. Another point of contest was the fencing of the park. And I think that that community also felt very betrayed because there, there was never going to be a fence. It was, it was really kind of sold to Treme, like this would be a beautiful green space that will be integrated into the neighborhood, and that didn't happen. Um, and so they don't, it almost, you can see it when you drive down the street, right? It, it almost feels like there's a wall. Treme residents were fed up. Interstate comes along on Claiborne Street, wipes out our businesses. Uh, the park comes along, takes away all our businesses, and what happens to us? We get unemployment. The Treme Community Improvement Association formed in 1969, fighting back against further destruction or displacement in the historic neighborhood under the guise of urban renewal. But it was too late. Historians estimate more than 400 families were now scattered throughout the city. The place was torn up, folk were displaced. Overnight, move, in with the bulldozers. Really? That would not happen to any other neighborhood where we don't live. It's still traumatic for the community and for people who had family here. So when that happened, you lost some of the, all the beautiful architects, architectural buildings and, and bars and houses. Construction projects and urban renewal left the community scrambling to hold on to the fabric that made it a community. And then the perfect storm opened the floodgates to a new wave of issues, leaving Treme clinging on to what's left of its culture.
imagine if Treme would have been allowed to develop parallel to that of the Marini and Bywater. Just think of what could have happened for the folk who lived there back then. Maybe they would still be here. Maybe they would be in business. Maybe their sons and daughters and grandkids might not be in jail for a rock or a joint. One can only imagine. New Orleans is no stranger to storms. We face many. We've triumphed. We've mourned. But what do you do when it seems the rain just won't stop falling? A most powerful hurricane, water attacking the city. Water was pouring into the city. Some would say calling New Orleans the Big Easy post-Katrina is a misnomer. The storm displaced hundreds of thousands. Some stayed away. For others, returning to the city presented a new challenge and nowhere tougher than Treme. I think short-term rentals really hit that neighborhood a lot harder than other communities. City Council member Kristen Palmer represents districts most affected by short-term rentals. As residents fought to find their way back into the city post-Katrina, newcomers had been opened up to the concept of Treme and other historic districts. There was now a growing interest to live closer to the city center, attracting new residents and new investment opportunities. Short-term rentals aren't to blame for the, the entirety of the ills of everything, but when you look at the percentage in a neighborhood, in a small neighborhood, you're literally taking units off the marketplace. And so in Treme, it definitely was impacted by, by a couple thousand units taken off the market. In 2015, there were a little over 1,900 Airbnbs across the city. As of December of 2018, the number has jumped to more than 6,500. In Treme, there are almost 400 Airbnb properties, some owned by investors not living in New Orleans. Of that number, 289 are entire homes or apartments. Within this block, within the close proximity of Charbonnet Funeral Home, how many Airbnbs do you think there are? Oh, there must be uh, 10 or 12. Just, with, just, just within the block? Just within the block, across the street. And everybody was saying what, about 10 years ago, oh, People come in, they come in, they're gonna gentrify it, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, guess what? The gentrifiers have been gentrified. For John Boutte, the higher cost of living in Treme post-Katrina discouraged him from returning to the neighborhood. He now lives in Lacombe, some 45 miles outside of New Orleans. I didn't want to pay that much money for the houses that, which, I grew up around and I knew the real value of those. We're in danger of losing its identity as the oldest black subdivision in the, in the United States. The makeup of Treme has shifted dramatically. In 2000, Treme was 92.4% black and 4.9% white. The latest census numbers show it now being 62.8% black and 28.2% white. The value of the property and versus the income has not kept pace. Folk cannot continue to earn seven fifty an hour and the, the price of rent is now $1,500 a month. It just doesn't work. Al Jackson has lived in Treme for decades. We've got a, a multi-billion dollar tourist industry. Why are folks still earning less than eight bucks an hour? How much money do you really need? Still, Jackson is not critical of those investing in Treme. So you're not opposed to Airbnb? No, not at all. Why not? Why should I be? No one's saying you can't do this. What they're saying is get off your duff and do it. They have a lot of history. The change is music to the ears of Adolph and Nigel Bynum. We feel it just need regulation. I'm not, we're not against it. We just feel like it should have been regulated a long time ago. It got out of control. And that's when I think the developers came in here, took advantage of it. The couple started investing in the Tremaine neighborhood years before home prices soared. This neighborhood was all blighted. They had no one living in it except the corner house. There was a drug culture here. And um, people spoke of Tremaine as 
the taboo place to go. And in an effort to change that culture, Bynum bought houses on his block. It's a studio apartment. Several of them. And, uh, revitalized them and put them on the market for rent. Would you have wanted that revitalization for the people who were native to this, this community? Definitely. How did we get them back here? Well, for one thing, I think that we got to start now. Yes. Uh, and I think part of it is home ownership. You know, yes. part of that is people not having the knowledge mm -hmm. and the vision about properties and not having the help to do it. I mean, this is the music that put New Orleans on the map around the world. And that's something Fred Johnson has worked 30 years to change. I was fortunate enough to help a couple of people buy in a Trimmy. Johnson is now the CEO of the Neighborhood Development Foundation, helping low to moderate income earners in New Orleans achieve the dream of home ownership. Because you lived there 40 years and paid rent 40 years, that don't mean you own it. He says skyrocketing rent left those living in Treme powerless. Because it's, it's like this, this locomotive is just running over them. And it's called economics. So they try to make it work as best they can until they can't make it work no more. Then they have to move on. Do you feel like Treme is in danger of losing its soul? I think it's already lost its soul. If the soul of Treme is lost, then the fight to keep the culture born here goes on. As a dirge, a D-R-G-E, it's a funeral procession. Al Jackson keeps the flame burning in the Petit Jazz Museum. The museum is my, my small contribution to the culture, to hope that the culture uh, can be maintained from a, from a memorial perspective. We keep fighting to keep the identity, particularly the cultural identity. Those closest to Treme say they've seen all sorts of storms, but none that washed away the city or its culture. We're still here, we're still playing music, and it's not gonna ever go away. Not completely, that's for sure. While the demographics of Treme may have changed, you can't deny that cultural energy. It's like it rises out of the asphalt, like the second lines that pass through the streets to this day. And with musicians like Kermit Ruffins, John Boutte, and Benny Jones carrying that torch, there's no way that Treme's light will ever die. Thanks for watching Treme, Death of a Neighborhood, Survival of a Culture.